Okay, hey, today we're going to review the steps of the scientific method. We're going to make it easy. I want to make sure that you understand each and every step and all the words, the terminology for the scientific method so you can be ready to take your final exam or the LEAP exam or whatever test you're going to take because nine times out of ten, let me rephrase that, ten times out of ten they are going to ask you about the scientific method. Science is knowledge and this is the basic thing for all science and all the different science fields. Okay. So with that, we're going to start our experiment and go over the steps with you to help you better understand the experiment and the scientific method. This is going to be a fictional experiment to try to help you understand the scientific method. But you use the scientific method every day. Every day, everybody pretty much uses the scientific method. They might not go through all the exact steps. They might just use a few steps to make a decision or figure out why something's not working, but you use the scientific method every day. Okay, well, we got these two lightsabers. If you've ever seen Star Wars, you know what I'm talking about. And we're gonna do a fictional experiment with these and to help you better um, understand the scientific method. First, we need to go over the steps of the scientific method, the seven basic steps. The very first step you're gonna do is you're gonna ask a question. I'm gonna ask a question about one of these, or both of these, because I wanna know something about it. The reason I asked the question is because I made observations about it, okay? So I asked the question, hmm, I wonder, I wonder why. Then I observe, I make observations, I use my five senses, and then I draw an inference from that, meaning I make a small prediction based on the knowledge that I get from observing the objects or the lightsabers, okay? With that information, I form a hypothesis, and a lot of people call that an educated guess, which is kind of right, but it's really not, because a hypothesis is gonna be like a statement that you believe is true. It's gonna be, if this happens, then this will happen. It's an if-then statement, okay? And then you're gonna run, you're going to design an experiment after that and you're going to run through your experiment and you're going to find out if your hypothesis is supported or not. Okay? Once you run your experiment, you're going to calculate the data and you're going to do all this math or however it, your data is going to be measured using the independent and dependent variables in your experiment. Then you're going to see does it support your hypothesis or it doesn't. If you do the experiment correct, and you do it perfectly and it doesn't support your hypothesis, remember, you didn't do anything wrong. You have to readjust or rethink your hypothesis. That's it. You don't change the experiment to, fix, to fit your hypothesis. You just change your hypothesis and come up with a better one, okay? And then once you draw your conclusions and if it does support your hypothesis, then you can communicate it with the community or whatever, okay? What we're going to do is, I was cutting things with the lightsaber and I noticed that the blue lightsaber was stronger than the red lightsaber. So I was thinking, does color have something to do with the strength of the lightsaber? So I said, I think that the blue lightsaber might be stronger because the blue is stronger than red. But I couldn't set up an experiment like that because, you know, that's just too vague. So I was like, what color lightsaber, what color laser, plasma laser would be the strongest? More so the temperature of it because usually the hotter the temperature, the more it can cut through steel or whatever we're talking about. So if I turn these on, they both look really similar, but the blue one seems to be stronger. So I did that observation. And in my inference, I inferred that the blue one was stronger and it's probably because it's hotter, okay, going by color. And if you don't know anything about color, you have to use the um, visible spectrum. And I'll show you that right here. Light is part electricity and part magnetism. All waves have wavelengths and frequency. Right here, we're going to see the wavelength. All right, a wavelength is a distance from one peak of a light wave to the next. See the wavelength? Frequency is the number of wavelengths that pass by a certain point in one second. Alright? 
Photons are the little packet of energy that all light has and the more frequency the light has, the more energy it carries. So higher frequency, more energy. Well, if you look on this visible light scale, Purple has 400 and red has 700. That means it's nanometers apart. So 700 means they're further apart. 400 means they're closer together. Roy G. Bibbs tells you the colors of the visible light spectrum. All right, on the whole spectrum, gamma rays are the strongest, but we can't see gamma rays. We can only see visible light. Then you have x-rays, then ultraviolet light, then the visible light, then infrared, okay. then microwaves then radio okay so as you can see you know, a lot of people would think red would be hotter and blue would, would be cooler because that's how we think today blue seems to be like the ocean water and red is like fire but in actuality on the visible spectrum blue has a shorter wavelength so it has a little more energy and red has longer wavelengths so it has less energy and when we get into astronomy and we learn about red shift and blue shift Blue meaning things are coming toward us, that means that the waves are getting closer so it actually looks blue. And red shifting is when something's moving away from us in space, we're talking, and it starts to look red because the waves are spreading out, okay? Because sound waves and light waves, particles, photons, whatever it is, it's gonna go in waves, basically. So that's all we need to worry about on that. Okay, what is a red shift? Well, we know about light. Light is a wave and sound is a wave. So, you know, they got wavelengths and frequency. So, if there's an airplane and the engine's making a lot of sounds, it's vibrating all the air molecules. But if the plane's moving, it's going to compress the um, waves in the front and make it a higher frequency. And it's going to be louder in the back for the lower frequency. That's why when you hear the booming system, people's driving their cars by, you can always hear their bass when they pass you and as they go down the road. Okay? because the waves are more spread out, base waves. All right, so light's the same way. If you, have, if you have blue light, the waves are closer together. If you want it to be red light, you have to spread the waves apart. If you have a spaceship coming to Earth, flying super fast toward the Earth, it's gonna look blue towards you. It's the blue shift. And then it comes and picks up this cow, and then when it flies off really, really fast, it's going to look red because the waves are stretched back out again, and it's gonna appear to be a red. So for galaxies and stars, the further they are, and if they're moving away from us on the, on the telescopes, they're going to look red, okay?